Today I want to share with you four venomous reptile protocols that will keep you at the pinnacle of responsibility and above reproach. Hi, I'm TC Houston, former zookeeper and lifelong reptile enthusiast. And you're watching my channel called Reptile Mountain TV, a place where I can share evidence-based practices, keeping and breeding blue tongue skinks and a few others just for fun. Okay, bear with me, I have to do a disclaimer. Keeping venomous reptiles is a dangerous activity where a mistake can result in death. It should only be attempted by experienced and trained adults where legal. This video is for info only. For those who are concerned about credibility, I have worked with over 100 species of venomous reptiles over a period of 16 years. I've worked with them both in the field and in captivity, in the private sector and professionally, in an accredited university and a major AZA zoological park. Okay guys, hey, because I've put out in other videos that I keep Heloderma suspectum, the Gila monster, um, and it is the only current venomous species that I keep, um, mainly because here in the state where I live, they've outlawed the keeping of venomous snakes for private individuals. Private individuals are allowed, specifically stated, to keep animals in the family Helidermidae, which is the Gila monsters and beaded lizards, and thus I keep Gila monsters. But because I put that out there, I felt a responsibility to put out a video about responsible venomous protocols. And so these protocols today will help you to ensure that your procedures, at least when it comes to the idea of keeping venomous reptiles, it will keep you at the highest of integrity and above reproach. Okay, so these protocols, not rocket science. Very simple. Many of you are probably already doing them. Protocol number one, lock every enclosure. Lock every enclosure with a keyed lock. I recommend keys because you don't have to remember a code. Also, if you're incapacitated or you need someone else to cover for you, they can take the keys and not have to know the code. If you're incapacitated and you're the only one who knows the code, well, that's going to put the people who are trying to help you at a disadvantage. So keeping every individual enclosure locked. I know many um, venomous keepers that just lock the access to the room where they're kept. I believe that's personally a mistake. At the zoo that I worked at and at the university, every individual enclosure had to be locked, including in my own private collection when I kept many different species, every individual enclosure had to be locked. I currently have every individual enclosure locked. I know that's a common theme, locked, locked, locked. But the reality is, is that by doing so, you are saying to the general public, if there was ever a disaster, any sort of catastrophe, if everything was ever brought to, out of, into the question, you have every individual reptile that could pose autonomous harm to another human being through a venom envenomation, you have kept them under lock and key, every individual. Now I know a lot of folks have racks and they keep them in racks. You can lock every individual enclosure with a rack. Um, private message me if you're interested in knowing how to do that. I also have seen it where folks have done a column at a time or a row at a time. Now that is sufficient as well. But if you stick to every enclosure is locked and you only unlock one enclosure at a time when servicing your animals, you are going to increase the level of safety. Now it's not guaranteeing anything, but it will increase your level of safety and your level of focus. Not to mention, it will raise the integrity of what your practice is. Okay, now that you've caught the theme about locking individual enclosures, guess what the next protocol is? Locking the space and the area where the animals are housed. So at the zoo, we had everything in a two level um, access. You had to have a perimeter, so you had to get into the building or behind the scenes with a locked, uh, through locked access, and then the enclosures were locked. At the university, you had to get into the locked lab and then into the enclosures. There was a two level system. In my private uh, keeping, you have a locked room and then you have locked enclosures. So there needs to be a double locked access. So I recommend that you have the perimeter or the space where you keep the animals, be it an outhouse, be it a room, be it an entire facility, that there is a keyed lock to that space in addition to locking each individual enclosure. Okay, now that we've got locked very well established, I don't know how many times I've said locked today, However, 
Um, the other things that are important, guess what? Label. Label your stuff. It's common sense. Label the space with a caution or warning or at least putting out there, hey, venomous reptiles inside. Label the space. That gives people the opportunity to know what they're entering into. Also, labeling every individual enclosure with not only the contents of the enclosure, but also putting venomous if the animal is venomous. I recommend doing so in red. I personally do it in red and I do it in English and Spanish just to cover my bases. Not only that, but I also put do not handle on um, the label so that people not only know it's venomous, but they're not supposed to handle it, that I've given them instruction. Um, I know many zoos use the word hot behind the scenes to determine which ones are venomous and which ones are not. Um, the only thing that I'd say is caution with that is that not everybody, a Joe Schmo off the street, doesn't know what hot means. So if there is ever a risk of somebody coming into your, uh, having access to your space and they don't know what hot means, then you're putting them at a disadvantage. You might as well not be labeling them at all. I recommend that you use the word venomous and that you use the colors red or red in some aspect because that brings about caution and it brings about a warning. So label every individual enclosure and label your space. Okay, so we talked about locking and labeling. Now we're gonna talk about envenomation protocols or snake bite protocols, actually having a little booklet on hand um, or at least a pamphlet or a folder that has the, the following contents. It has the species um, description and a little bit about the species, talks about the venom, talks about anti-venom, talks about first aid treatment, talks about ongoing medical treatment, and has contact information for envenomation treatment specialists. By having a protocol for each species that you have, by having those folders, if in the event of an envenomation, if you've been bit, you can grab it and go to the hospital. Or you can grab it and they'll take you to the hospital if it's an ambulance that's taking you. Um, you can bring that and you can empower your medical care team to have the maximum, most current knowledge on hand for treating your situation. Because not every medical care team gets uh, any any training in this and you really don't want them to go to ER Google and try and figure it out when seconds count. So having that on hand is professional and essential. It is responsible as well. I know many zoos who keep protocols on hand. I know many universities that keep protocols on hand. I've gotten my protocols from Joe Pittman at Florida Snake Bite Institute. He has done an excellent job of collecting um, these uh, protocols for multiple different species. I encourage you to Google him, Google Florida Snake Bite Institute, and um, acquire them. You can also create them yourself, but why reinvent the will when he's done a stellar job? Okay, last but not least, keeping antivenom on hand is an absolute essential piece of responsible keeping. I know it is also a pain in the butt, it is also very difficult to acquire, and it can be very expensive. And it is much easier to, I don't know, I've heard people say rely on the local zoo. Um, but that is, that is incredibly irresponsible. It's also selfish. And it's just a bad idea. I know other people that rely on the local hospital if they're just keeping crotalus or crotalids, the, the rattlesnake species, um, because the local hospital may keep it for accidental envenomations in the wild. Also, slightly reckless, not the best um, choice and it's definitely not the most responsible. I know that I've done that in the past with uh, Crotalus. I'm not proud of it. It was a mistake and I was wrong. What should be done is to keep it on hand. There are some solutions that several keepers have come together. They've pooled their money and they've come into some sort of anti-venom bank. Um, some of the uh, envenomate or some of the some of the antivenoms are um, not FDA approved. So there's just a lot of red tape and loopholes. Um, However, it is, an, it is really an essential thing, a responsible thing to do because relying on someone else's anti-venom, if it's the zoo or the local hospital, um, you are putting whoever was going to need that at risk. I'll give you an example. When I worked at the zoo one day at about 3 in the morning, I was sound asleep. I get a phone call from the local hospital. A private keeper had been bit by nausea pallidia 
the red spitting cobra, um, and he did not have anti-venom. They needed ours. So I drove down to the zoo, got the anti-venom per our policy, and gave it to the ambulance for um, them to rush it to the hospital to help this gentleman. The entire time, while the anti-venom was not at our facility and was being used for some other purpose, it was putting our keepers and our lives at risk for not having a life-saving resource in case of an accidental envenomation. Thankfully, nothing happened. Thankfully, that man survived. He did have some pretty significant residual effects from the bite, um, and he's not a bad person. However, what he did by keeping something without having the anti-venom on hand was irresponsible, and it risked the lives of the keepers, our lives, at the zoo. I recommend that you keep your own anti-venom. If you can't acquire it or you're not interested in acquiring it, then venomous reptile keeping of that particular species is not for you if you're intending to do it with professionalism and responsible actions. So thanks so much for putting up with this one. I know it's kind of a serious one, but you know what? Venomous reptiles are no joke. A lot of folks, oh no, it's no big deal. And you know, I, I've been around long enough to watch posts of guys that think, hey, I'm gonna free handle and it's not a big deal, it's not gonna affect me or anything, and then they get hit and they get tagged and they kind of eat crow a little bit on the forums and then they do it again and they screw up and get hit again. I know one individual, he ended up dying um, because of this and it was really sad. He lost his life for his passion when he really could have maintained his passion by observing some protocols, not free handling, and being a little bit more responsible and he could still be around today enjoying his hobby and actually um, being a part of his family. And there's several others that have gotten bitten in it and because they were you know, not following protocols or they were free handling or being a little reckless, they ended up, not only did they get bit and they have that fallout, but then there was legislative fallout and other keepers that were doing it the right way ended up losing uh, their freedoms for someone who wasn't willing to be responsible. So I just encourage folks to be responsible, be grown up about it. If you're not going to be grown up about it, it's just not for you. There are plenty of other really cool animals out there that you can keep. So thanks so much, and I appreciate your time. Stay tuned for future videos. We've got one coming up on genetics, another coming up on visual traits and morphs, a few others on husbandry, mostly about Taliqua, the blue tongue skinks. I'm not going to be doing a lot more on the venomous thing. Um, I just had to put this one out there. But as always, I will see you on another YouTube episode. Environment to regulate his body temperature to ensure that he's at the correct metabolism.